Welcome to Woking Up. Uh, uh. White supremacy. What, what white supremacy is the fringe of the fringe. This is a mini series brought to you by Polite Conversations. All of a sudden, we can't talk about Neanderthal DNA anymore. Here, I'll talk about my journey into and out of being a new atheist Sam Harris fan. In and of itself, in and of itself, that video is not evidence of racism. I'm your ex-Muslim host, Ina. No, not the right-wing kind. Thank you for tuning in. This is how the left will die. Oh, hello, Wokesters. Fancy bumping into you here. My, my, you've been busy since we last chatted. I mean, I'll leave you for a couple of weeks and you take away Mr. Potato Head's genitals. That is the dangerous, woke authoritarianism Sam Harris has been warning us about for years now. It wouldn't have got this bad if we had only listened to the wise and enlightened one. And shush, 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 never mind that Boise State University has just apparently canceled 52 diversity classes because lawmakers were looking to rein in on social justice. And never mind that they've advanced a budget, cutting funding, threatened further cuts, and added provisions, barring Idaho universities from using state funding to support social justice activities, clubs, events, or organizations. Never mind all that. The larger issue here is that Hasbro decided to maybe slightly tweak its Mr. Potato Head packaging. Focus on the goal, guys. Wokeness, wokeness, wokeness. The absolute worst thing humanity has ever had to face, perhaps. Nothing else threatens free speech in this way. Especially if you, you know, pay no attention to the right at all, where the government is actually trying to silence people and outlaw wokeness and quote-unquote divisive concepts like discussions about racism and sexism. Free speech for everyone, especially people we disagree with, like Nazis. But not for the woke, seems to be the IDW line on this. And on that note, welcome to episode 5, you wonderful SJWs. If you're enjoying this show, do consider supporting via Patreon, because, you know, if you don't, that would just be cancel culture. You'd be silencing me or something. (laughs) Totally kidding, of course, of course. A more serious reason to support the show is that every time you sign up on my Patreon, Sam Harris sheds a tear. For real, though. If you support it, that would be wonderful, because... It's a tiny show that needs listeners like you to help it survive and thrive. You'll also get access to full episodes of Woking Up early, because at first these episodes are only available in full via Patreon, since this whole thing began as a Patreon-exclusive project. I do eventually release them publicly. Episodes 1 to 4 are out in full now on your podcatchers and on Spotify, too. But if you're listening to a 20 or 30 minute version of this right now, that's not the entire episode, but just a segment for public release. Just thought I'd clarify that. Anywho, I'm glad you're joining me today for episode five. We're going to talk a bit about the politics of identity, aka identity politics. And like cancel culture... This, too, is something right-wingers and IDW types like Sam Harris are extremely coherent and consistent on. But before we dive into any IDW or Sam's hot takes, I thought I would talk more about my identity. Because as you may know, ex-Muslim women, especially those who've suffered Islamic oppression in a theocracy, are often used as pawns by the rational ones. So I wanted to unpack that a bit and give you some background. First, what about my identity made me an always fairly progressive person, I thought, attracted to this edgy atheist scene in the first place? Well, it honestly didn't seem as obviously bad back then as it does now. I mean, Sam was once the guy pushing back against targets like Bill O'Reilly. It seemed like a good thing. 
But there were always darker aspects to the whole new atheism thing too, of course. I do think it has shifted significantly to the right over the last few years, but the seeds of that shittiness were always there and I kick myself for not seeing them sooner. So I'm constantly trying to figure out how and why I fell into it. I think about that a fair bit because it's such a cringe period for me and here's some of what I think happened. And none of these are excuses, mind you, just explanations. Oh, and pardon the dramatism here. Um, I'm, I'm practicing my editing skills, you know? So, growing up in a theocracy as a woman, having an automatic second-class status, then being forced by the state to cover up, to segregate from men, Seeing and experiencing the terror of literal morality police firsthand. Seeing them hit my mom's ankle in front of me when I was little as we walked past. Just because her headscarf slipped. Things like that, you know. Left me with deep emotional scars and trauma. And unbelievable anger around the topic of religion because all of this was, you know, justified by it. When I was going through puberty, and my mom got me my first training bra, to my preteen mind, it was embarrassing enough on its own that she noticed I needed one. But she also had to have another conversation with me, one she didn't choose to have, but knew she had to, to keep me safe. The conversation was about how I'm growing up and looking more and more like a woman, less like a kid, hence the training bra, and looking more uh, developed would make me a target for morality police. So this was the age I would also have to start wearing an abaya or burqa. And it was like a double blow for me. Not only was I going through regular, awkward puberty where your developing breasts are kind of embarrassing, I was going to have to start wearing a big, giant, black cloak to hide the shape of my body, too, which only drew attention to it and made the whole thing much more embarrassing and awkward. If puberty wasn't tough enough already, try doing it as a girl in Saudi fucking Arabia. And just little wounds like that along the way. I can't count how many times I was made to feel less human because I was a girl or a woman. And as I said earlier, it was all neatly justified by faith and scripture. I'm still not a fan of it at all, to be quite honest. Like, not even in the slightest. I do think it's a relic of the past, inherently conservative and trad lifey. I really wish we'd all outgrow it, and even the progressive versions of it are problematic to me. Sure, they are progressive on the surface, but I do have issues with the structures of religious suppression. They too indirectly legitimize. But anyway, I'm not here to lecture anyone on all that right now. It has, since my new atheist days, become a much less important issue for me, especially in the urgency of a political climate where the far right has been thriving, and so-called intellectuals are attempting to revive things like race science again, which seems like a much more immediate threat to me as someone who exists in the West now, where at least in Canada, religion has largely been defanged. Obviously, I continue to push back against conservatives and conservatism in the Muslim community in any way I can without being hijacked by anti-Muslims. I do want to take a minute to point out some glaring, rational genius brain hypocrisy that always kind of poked at me and bothered me. You know, pushing back against Islamic conservatism and right-wingery was always applauded in the atheist scene. 
Everyone was suddenly very progressive and very SJW, dare I say, <laughs> in that context. Um, even the most anti-SJW types were fine with talking about recognizing structures of oppression and privilege when it came to religion. Heck, even mansplaining was completely accepted when it came to talking about scriptures and texts and interpreters and preachers. And if I brought up something like Muslim microaggressions even towards ex-Muslims and non-Muslims in Islamic communities, things like expecting everyone to use religious Muslim greetings, etc., that too was embraced and celebrated, but... <laughs> Fuck, the contrast was blinding when that social justice or critical lens was turned inwards or turned towards Western right-wingery or injustices here. And it was really confusing and took me a bit to figure out what was happening and that I wasn't just imagining these blatant double standards. <laughs> Definitely no identity politics or tribalism happening here, nuh uh. But I digress. Back to my current views on religion. I just wanted to make it clear that though my dislike of religion remains, my views have evolved and matured greatly. I am much more happy to ally with progressive theists who share some of my values rather than right-wing atheists who share none of them, except for a rejection of God, which on its own is pretty meaningless and empty. My rejection of all that stemmed from questions that came from my progressive views, as I've said before, from my feminism and from my desire to fight for minorities, to make the world a better, fairer place. And to see the online atheist scene today embodying the exact opposite of all those things makes me feel like I want nothing to do with that. I honestly feel such a great sense of relief that I escaped it, thought my way out of it, updated my views, just like when I was leaving religion, you know? I mean, some of those extremely rational people are perpetually stuck in 2012. It is always the ones who tout their free-thinking abilities and critical thinking skills that are so set in their ways, so dogmatic. I'm very glad to not be a part of that scene anymore, but yeah... Theocratic oppression and related trauma unfortunately leaves you vulnerable to that kind of shallow, angry, edgy situation. At first, when I started speaking about having left religion publicly, I wanted to talk about it all the time. It felt cathartic to lash out and get my anger out. Simple, quick answers are so seductive and satisfying. Yes, religion is the main problem in the world. That's what we have to push back against and everything will be so much better. <laughs> oh boy, did the Trump era and the atheist Christian alliances against wokeness or any sort of progress or justice disprove that. But anyway, eventually you grow tired of hitting that one note, or at least I did. Religion, bad. Religion, not true. And then you start searching for more. More meaning. More depth. More complexity. More understanding of the current, moving, shifting world around you. Outside of the low-hanging fruits like owning creationists. I mean, certainly when I see the many edgelordy ex-Muslims today, I can sort of understand what put them on that path, but what I can't understand is when after years and years and years and years of spouting the same shit, some of them have not changed a bit, have not sought out anything more than Islam bad, have not been alarmed as the far right hijack their voices and talking points, and instead have become so steeped themselves in the hatred and anger that they have fully embraced right wing and even far right talking points on subjects other than Islam too. And they've come full circle to defend the conservative values they claim to have rejected Islam because of. I am beyond appalled when I see an ex-Muslim woman from Pakistan 
Pakistan, tweeting furiously, understandably, about some mullah's regressive views on women. But then turn around and fucking embrace Jordan Peterson or some shit and walk down that anti-feminist path with him because he said Islam sucks and they saw an ally or something. For some ex-Muslims and movement atheists who've fallen further and further down that right-wing rabbit hole, it's sadly very much about their political short-sightedness. They hate the woke and the left because they won't join them with the same passion in focusing solely on Muslims and Islam. Because why would they? And that makes them enemies on everything else. And when the right start love-bombing, and are more than happy to single Muslims and Islam out for criticism, they become the allies and the perceived quote-unquote truth-tellers. And from there, they follow them down every fucking garbage road. Anti-trans, anti-BLM, anti-feminism, anti-anti-racism, pro-race and IQ, pro-Trump, anti-immigrant, anti-lockdown even at times. And that is unfortunately why the ex-Muslim scene became Candace owens and why the atheist scene in general became so Dave (laughs) Rubenized. Thankfully, I got out before I was anywhere near that level of garbage politics, to be clear, but still... Even being more centristy in that time and unironically using terms like regressive left is so cringe and embarrassing to me now. You have no idea. But yeah, for me, I guess it was a few things. First, the religious trauma, and then I think being what they call a third culture kid also had an impact in that I have always felt like an outsider everywhere. A third culture kid or individual is defined as someone who was raised in a culture other than their parents or the culture of their nationality, and also lived in a different environment during a significant part of their childhood development years. So, my being Pakistani, but also from Saudi, but segregated from local Saudis, was a pretty strange environment to grow up in. Unique, sure, but also isolating and... Something that can leave you feeling rootless and in search of an identity, a community. I never would be accepted as Saudi because they just don't do that, even if you're born there. And never would be fully accepted as Pakistani enough because my upbringing was very different. My education was Western. Such a tangled web of different cultural influences. You know, I envy the people who get asked the where are you from or what's your background question and they don't have to think for like five minutes about what the simplest way to answer that would be. Or even the people who have a distinct answer to what's your hometown or heck, even those who can visit their childhood home. And, you know, for much of my teenage life and young adult life, I satisfied that search for identity and community through subcultural affiliations, dog collars and spikes and lace corsets and bondage cuffs. Not quite the fashion choices you'd think of, coming from someone who grew up in Saudi Arabia, (laughs) which was always an interesting juxtaposition when I was finally in Canada. Whenever people saw me and found out more about my background, the looks on their faces were highly amusing. Saudi Arabia would just not compute, you know? And then as I left uni life behind and settled into full-on adult life, when it was no longer practical to spend the day in six-inch heeled goth boots and go clubbing every other night, I eventually discovered the subculture of online atheism. Yay! And what a subculture that was. My goodness. At first, it felt like, wow, these are my people, finally. I feel like I can discuss my views about religion and things openly. (laughs) And then, it was like those zombie movies where everyone you know is slowly being infected. Except in this case, it was being exposed as some sort of bigot. Every direction you turned, everyone you respected, they turn around and fuck, they're a racism zombie too. Ah, run. (laughs) That is really what it felt like. 
So yeah, a little less fun than exploring the local fetish night. But I think a few other experiences along the way had sort of prepped me for the new atheist scene too. By 2013, I was just dipping my toes into the online atheist scene, but not fully immersed yet. I used to write a blog about sexuality in Pakistan. Please subscribe via patreon.com forward slash nice mangoes to hear the full episode. By supporting on Patreon, you'll get access to all Patreon-exclusive content, including Woking Up and early releases of Polite Conversations too, as well as special patron events like AMAs and Skype chats. If you enjoy the show, do consider supporting, because without listeners like you, deep dive content like this isn't possible.